Do you know about the riddle of steel? No, not that one. I'm talking about a different kind of riddle. From testing reproduction swords, I've seen a lot of damage over the years. However, when wandering the halls of museums looking for signs of use, I'm like, Where are they? So I figured, why not have a chat with someone who's seen and handled a lot more original swords from various time periods than I have, like Matt Easton from Scala Gladiatoria. Thanks, Matt, for joining me. Let's have a little talk about edge damage. Yes. So you've been to more museums than I have, I'm sure. Canada is a little bit deprived when it comes to medieval museums, at least. But every time I'm at a museum, I try to look for signs of wear, and I almost never find anything. Uh, there's only pretty minor things. But you would expect quite a bit, right? And you've handled a number of original swords, and you've seen some damage, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, so basically, the swords that survive, whether it's Bronze Age, Iron Age, Roman, Medieval, post-Medieval, they basically split into different categories. There's those that are on the antiques market that are being freely traded. There's those that are in museums. And then within museums, um, they split into different types as well. There's those that have been in collections, um, sometimes princely or ducal collections uh, for hundreds of years in some cases. Um, some that were bought from the antique uh, antiquarian art markets and then came into museums, places like the Wallace Collection, for example, they were cherry picked, essentially. And then, of course, they were treated certain ways when they came into the collections, which we'll probably talk about later. Um, and then there's things which come out of um, archaeology. I think the archaeological examples are often the most interesting ones yes. because they're, they're the least likely to have been messed around with. And you know the most about their provenance. You know where they came from, when they were found, in what context context um, and you know for the most part they haven't been altered because they're treated as archaeological items rather than art items at least more recent archaeology you know, in the the early days of archaeology yeah. they might have just damaged something with a spade or whatever and have didn't yeah. even document what happened and how it was found exactly but yeah they've gotten a lot better iron age blades in particular there could be all kinds of battle damage that we don't see because they're so heavily corroded that you can't even see what the outline was originally. Yeah, and, and you know, within archaeology, particularly with iron, not so much with bronze, because bronze preserves pretty well, but um, with iron and steel uh, blades, that's the secondary thing, is when you see damage in a blade, is that from combat? Is that from another weapon? Is it from hitting a helmet or, you know, a, uh, you know, a langet on a pole arm? So is that something that was got at the time or is that something that's happened in the ground and a hundred percent you know um if we look at the castillon sword, the so-called castillon swords uh, for example they were allegedly dredged out of a river the river dordogne in france um by dredging machinery you know they were literally like scooped out by giant uh, machines so a lot of them got broken and bent and damaged in that process now when it comes to sort of reproductions we have certain ideas about how sturdy something should be and in fact some people have kind of overblown expectations case in point the albion principe when people saw in the video how it was damaged they were like what i didn't know albion was such terrible quality and it's like <laughs> hang on a moment like, this is perfectly reasonable, really, especially considering what happened. Like I showed how I hit that branch at a really bad yeah. angle and it, it kind of gouged it. And, um, you know, I tried to repair it as much as I could, but I, I didn't go the whole way of just grinding it out completely. So you have a weak spot and then that's more likely to, to be damaged. So this is another one, another reproduction of the same type, the uh, Alexandria Arsenal. When you look at that, the original blade is really this thin. And yeah. so and that was with inferior steel. Like what yeah. we have now is better quality, is more homogenous and everything. Uh, so that just makes you think how disposable were swords, which is ironic because they also cost a whole lot and, and often were prestige items. But if a modern reproduction made with superior material is damaged this easily. And the original is just like that, just that thin. 
Just imagine what happens to it. They grow up like we did, watching all the movies that we love, all the sword and sorcery and historical mm -hmm. epics and stuff, where where your hero gets their hero's sword, usually at some point early in the story, and spends the rest of the movie fighting with that sword. And at the end, it looks as immaculate as it did at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, you take something like Lord of the Rings, and uh, they're, they're actually training with, with their sharp, their sharp uh, real swords. Uh, you know, Boromir is training the hobbits, and it's like, why are you using your real sharp swords? To just pick up a stick, you know? Mm -hmm. um, be a lot safer as well. They're just a piece of metal. And anyone who works with, with hand tools knows that if it doesn't matter how good the steel is, how hard it is, it will get damaged if you smash it into other hard objects. And even in Hema with, with blunt practice swords, mm -hmm. they get chewed up quite a bit. And yeah. they're much more durable, of course, because they don't have a thin edge. I remember reading or hearing about a source that described how a knight's sword started to look like a saw after mm. a battle, right? You, you, you've probably yeah. read that too, right? Yeah. And that actually makes a lot of sense, particularly after some of the tests that I've done. Yes, you will absolutely chew it up. You will get massive nicks and gouges. In fact, even when you're being careful, that was a real eye-opener. You know, when I try to do realistic tests that consist of blade-on-blade -blade contact, but with, you know, even deflectional parries with the flat, where I try to do edge-on-flat, it'll still damage the edge significantly. Yeah. I've had some edge damage from trying to do flat-on-flat, -flat, which is wild, yeah. just because the angle sometimes is just a little bit off and you don't yeah. quite notice it. And even just a little bit will absolutely damage it. No matter how much you try and preserve the edge and protect the edge, it's going to hit other hard objects. Mm -hmm. Just whether it's other blades, whether it's the cross guard, which you can't avoid hitting if someone defends themselves, uh, whether it's helmets or shield bosses. Shield bosses can be really destructive. Oh. And I've seen blades break on shield bosses. Mm -hmm. Even just bone. If the, the edge yeah, alignment isn't perfect yeah. and it gets stuck, <clears throat> absolutely just like wood. It'll damage yeah. it. Funnily enough, someone sent me a picture today of a, of a good quality, modern-made Japanese um, blade, which was completely chipped up by um, cutting uh, freshly killed pig carcass, right. and the blade had chipped on the bone. When it comes to specific examples, that's a very obvious one, where you have damage from blocking and parrying uh -huh. with, with the strong of the blade. This one here is kind of an interesting case, because we can't really say with certainty. Is this battle damage or is this damage that happened after depositing it? So, so these two examples are an interesting contrast, actually, because they, they fit into what I described about the two different types of museum examples. So the first one is clearly one that's been looked after. It, it's a rapier, uh, I imagine about 1600 in date. Um, and it's been looked after and kept in collections since it was made. Whereas the second example is archaeological. OK, mm -hmm. now the problem with the first example is there'll always be a question over when did that edge damage happen? Right. Why and how? So in the Victorian uh, military sword collecting world, it is not uncommon to find swords with a lot of edge damage. And we know that it's from children playing with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Veneration cases, for history. Yeah, yeah. And even in some cases, I've bought swords off uh, people and uh, they've come out of the attic and I've been like, oh, it's got edge damage. And they've said, oh, yeah, that was me and my uh, sister uh, when we were kids. I remember doing that, you know, literally because they see they see Errol Flynn sword fighting. And mm -hmm. so, or they take granddad's World War One sword and they have a play with it. And that's how the edge got damaged. But with the second sword, we categorically know that that happened at some time in the past. That didn't mm -hmm. happen like, you know, 20 years ago. That happened either in the, the 15th century. So I think this is one of the Castillon swords. Yeah. Um, and so it's mid 15th century, uh, probably. Did that damage happen in a fight or did it happen archaeologically? Um, we don't know. Um, sometimes you can tell. And so I have, I've had the great honor to um, handle and study and measure quite a few of the Castillon swords, including at the Royal Armouries and other places. And some of them definitely have edge damage, which is from another blade, because you can see there is a triangular notch and the metal is turned over. It can only be from another blade. Some of the Castillon swords were restored. <laughs> um, and so they literally, when they were 
again, allegedly found in the 1970s or leading up to the 1970s. And after that, from about 1975 onwards, they were sold to various museums and into private collections. And some people, private collectors, restored them or sent them off to restorers and had the blades improved. So, unfortunately, some of them have lost some of that data. Someone literally went in, welded in a part, and then aged it to make it look like the rest of the blade. Yes. So, yeah, it happens, unfortunately, in the private collecting world. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't usually happen with museums these days. I think it probably did decades ago, um, but it doesn't these days. And this is one of those ones I don't know. I don't know with this. It's pretty massive damage, so it looks like yeah. it might be, might be from armor, perhaps, but or a shield, but it's really hard yeah. to say. In, in so fact, it so looks pretty similar to the damage I had on the Principe. So it could have been a similar yeah. case where it, the, the edge rolled first and was yeah. weakened. And then upon yeah. another impact or several more, it just broke off because... And like your like your Principe, that to me, if the, if that did happen in use, that looks like damage not from hitting another sword, but from hitting a larger, rounder object, like yeah, maybe exactly. a helmet or a buckler yeah. or, helmet, you know, mm. or part of a pole axe. So you 100% do find archaeological swords that have combat damage. And you also find notches in the guards as well, not just on the blades, but on the guards. There's definitely Bronze Age swords which have really, really crazy amount of um, edge damage. And then later on, there's 19th century swords which have it, where we know that they've used them as practice weapons, as drill weapons. Um, uh, so cutlasses, for example, you sometimes find with a crazy amount of edge damage because they've been on board ship for months and they've been using this as a practice weapon. Another thing um, that I, I thought about a lot in, in recent years is how much we don't see in repairs. How do you repair nicks in the edge? You have to grind it out. So if you want to be very thorough about it, you will kind of retaper the entire blade to hide that. If you don't care about that, then there's just going to be a little bit of a dip, right? So if it's done well, it can be restored in such a way that you can't tell easily that it was repaired. Other than, you know, if you knew the original blade, you would notice that, oh, it's a little bit narrower. But to use a Japanese example, we 100% know that Japanese swords are repaired in this way. But so they, they maintain the edge geometry. Obviously, with the Japanese sword, you've got a hamon, you've got a hardened mm -hmm. edge. And if you lose too much of that, you're, the sword's dead, essentially, as a sword, as a weapon. Um, and so, you know, when a, when a Japanese sword takes a chip out of the blade, they look very carefully at whether it's possible to save that sword. And oftentimes it is. Um, but often, I think a lot of people don't realize often how you see a Japanese sword in a museum today it has been polished so many times that very often the hamon would have been somewhat deeper originally. And same thing with the tip. Um, so right. if it, uses, it loses the tip, because obviously the hamon goes around the tip, and there are some blades where you can see the hamon disappears and the, there is a tip there, but it's not the hard steel anymore. European swords were, I think, for the most part, more mass produced, uh, certainly in what we classically call the medieval period. Um, and so they were churning out so many blades that if one went beyond the kind of the bounds of this is not really useful anymore, you'd throw it away or recycle it into a kitchen knife and just, just yeah. get a new one. That's a, that's a question that people have asked. You know, did, did, did they reuse broken blades and make daggers out oh, of yeah. them or not? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they would reuse a lot if possible because well, material was a lot more expensive back then then it is now much less abundant and they didn't have this throwaway culture. So yeah, absolutely. Whenever possible, they would try to salvage something and make a smaller blade out of it, perhaps. For example, Highland Dirks often feature actual broken sword blades. You know, mm. you can see it's a sword blade that's uh, uh, sort of from the, the center of percussion upwards to where it's broken, which is a common place for them to break. In many other regions, they would literally just reforge the piece of steel because there's nothing to stop you annealing it and making it into something else you know so true you can reforge it like they, they wouldn't have been able to uh, melt and recast the way it's sometimes shown no, but no, no. <laughs> reforge you can so there's examples in museum of, of broken blades where they have literally forged welds them back together because they were historical or significant swords and we know this was done in period as well because we found archaeologically medieval swords where the blades have been uh, forge welded back together and they uh, would be useless actually as weapons mm -hmm. the first person you hit with them um, the the blade would probably fall apart again at that forge weld um, but they did it anyway 
presumably because that sword had some significance for them, like it was their grandfather's sword or it was the sword that showed that they were the duke or baron of a certain area or this kind of thing, you know, so they, they kept them. Another thing to consider about the whole preserving your edge idea, even if you as the, the swordsman on the one side were really conscious of that and really try to preserve your edge, what happens when you strike and the opponent blocks, it's going to be damaged. It's better for the opponent because the strong of the blade is damaged, no big deal, but your yeah. weak is going to be damaged, the part that you actually cut with, and there's literally nothing you can do about it, unless you manage to, to pull it right before impact and avoid yeah. contact. So this is actually one of my bugbears in, in HEMA um, tournaments and sparring and stuff, is that people really smash their swords into each other, um, and they're using modern steel, modern heat treatment, and their blades are blunt. Um, mm -hmm. And if those blades were sharp, then the minute you get a nick in your edge, that's a stress riser, and that blade's more likely to break. Okay, yes. so a sharp is much more fragile than a blunt. By, but also, historical steel is not as strong as modern steel, not as reliable. And, you know, you know the consequences are more serious as well. If your blade breaks in an actual fight, exactly like you say, if a person's defending and you're swinging at them, they're defending with the thickest, strongest part of their blade, and you're plowing one of the weakest parts of your blade into theirs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the odds are that your blade's gonna come off worse than theirs. So the defender has uh, not only kind of like a legal and moral kind of uh, strength if they're, the, they're defending themselves, but they, they have a literal strength. They're yeah. defending with the strong of their blade against the weak of yours. Yeah, which is why I'm actually surprised that we don't see more blades that are blunt in the lower third. Because to me, that seems like the obvious thing. There are Victorian swords. I can. Yeah, later ones one. do that. But yeah, I'll grab one. I'll just grab one off. Oh, so we actually have certain styles of blade like this one, which is utterly blunt yeah. up to there. So it's it's like a an H girder, and then the rest of the blade is is edged from there. So they did do that later, specifically, yeah. and you know for that reason. But you're right; it, it is weird in a way that so many medieval swords are edged all the way down to the to the guard because why? It seems you know? unnecessary, unless yeah. with a messer I can see it especially a shorter one, because you can absolutely use it as a tool. And if you do, you would use the bottom. I wonder if it's partly also because for a, for a long period of time, the blades themselves weren't really being used defensively. People were using shields and bucklers there, and yeah, stuff. So there's that too. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so, you know, the Victorians traveling around the world, when they encountered people who still use shields and bucklers, they always remark that, oh, they don't defend with their swords. They just defend with the shield. Um, and, you know, in the Victorian sense of self-superiority, they were like, well, they haven't worked out how to defend with their blades yet. Of course, they did know how to, but if you've got a shield, well, then you defend with a shield, which is a better thing to defend with. The good thing is, even if your edge gets really chewed up, or even if your blade breaks, you still have the most dangerous weapon available. <laughs> yeah, so I think we should uh, wrap it up here. Um, yeah. People don't want to sit through too much, but I hope you found this interesting. And thank you, Matt, for joining me here and having that conversation. Next time you're at a museum, see if you can find some damage somewhere. And if you do, keep in mind, this may not have happened at the time. Thanks for watching. Take care.